How do you keep keep it real? Like the prophet said, go visit the cemetery. Go visit these people that all had something to do the next day. All had duties to fulfill, goals to kick. They never got to do them. Go visit them. Go and ponder there because the cemetery is one place I tell everybody. There's no boasting. Everybody's there for one reason, for the end. Joining us today on the One Path podcast is the famous Muslim undertaker, someone who's gained millions of views across social media and TikTok, and someone who's garnered hundreds and thousands of followers teaching them about death and dying. He's one of Australia's most experienced funeral directors and mortician operating out of the Kemba Mosque in Sydney, Australia. Brother Ahmed Harachi, it's great to have you back on One Path. If you want to grow your money but are not sure how or where to start or are just petrified of the amount of interest and haram surrounding investments, download this, the Halal Money app. A neat and easy to use app that makes investing your money into Halal certified investment funds super easy. They've done all the work for you so you can invest in peace. Download it now. Let's get back to the podcast. How are you feeling? Alhamdulillah, I Subhanallah, come on. When I see you, I remember watching you on that table. Yeah, what a so, scary day that was. What a frightening day that was. But Ahmed, it's, you know, I have to say, uh, Subhanallah, you are pretty much a Zahid in, in the sense that whenever we see you, you're always in uniform. It's always that like your job never stops. You're always, always, always on the phone, always on, always, you know, just even before this podcast is even recording. Subhanallah, I was so happy to see you and just to hear you and just to look at your smile, Subhanallah. But you just literally five minutes before this recording, you just received a phone call of someone who was mm -hmm. passing away from cancer, sister, Subhanallah. To you said in her early 20s, you just overheard on the phone. And you said, I'll be there 45 minutes. I'm just going to do that. Like, you are a person who really never, you know, get this is your job. This is your life. Mm -hmm. And just on that, I wanted to ask you how has been the feedback from the video that we've done, but life as an undertaker, just walk us, just walk us through it. You know, for me, it's not a job, my brother. It's, it's a blessing. It's an honor. I serve my community. And I say to every single day, death does not take days off. Mm -hmm. So I don't take days off. That's right. There's nothing called a Sunday or a rest day. I keep going until I cannot go anymore. Mm. People are dying. People need help. People need to be attended to. And wallah, as long as I'm able to and my health is going, I keep doing that. That's I right. want to build my ending, mate. That's right. I'm investing in my akhirah. Subhanallah. Mm. We need to speak to you about that video, that documentary that we mm. produced with you. Alhamdulillah, I'd have to say it was one of the most impactful videos I've personally ever been involved in. Mm -hmm. And judging by the comments, uh, many people do feel the same. Um, we've got a couple here, yeah, actually. We've got, we've, got, here. we've got one from, he said, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian and this is one of the most humbling videos I've ever watched. Thank you. Non-Muslim here. What an eye-opening watch. Uh, I am a non-Muslim, but watching this video, I have never been so emotional like this and taking so many things for granted. My brother, God bless you. And the one last one here. Um, Man, I am a Christian and I'm still with tears because we too want to die with God, giving us mercy when he was saying those words. I put myself in that place and man, it's very hard. Yeah. What is the feedback being like? Well, uh, I try to respond to every single comment. Mm -hmm. I mean, just personal, on my personal pages, mm -hmm. you know, I'm getting messages like, brother, after your video, I wear the hijab now. That's brother, your video made me reconsider suicide. Brother, your video made me now go visit my parents after 10 years. Yeah. These are the kind of messages I get on a daily basis. So Alhamdulillah, I know the message is getting out there. But I, even in relation to our video, um, I told you like you know, I was in a uh, in an airport mm -hmm. and the pilot, he was next to me and he said to me, I've seen you somewhere. <laughs> and I just looked at him and he goes, that's right, you watched that guy. <laughs> and SubhanAllah, I was like, yes. And even, you know, going different places, that video went, yeah. it, it was a Dawi, man. Mm -hmm. um, in our own community, the feedback was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I think it was perfectly done by One Path. It was perfectly put together and yeah. it was the perfect timing. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'd have to say that Brother Ahmed Harashi actually deserves a Netflix documentary. Mm -hmm. Of course, Netflix, own series. avoid that by all costs, but <laughs> he deserves it. Alhamdulillah. I think, you know, just even being there on location filming, just sitting behind the camera and watching you go through that and mm -hmm. going to the cemetery, even subhanAllah, when we went to the grave of your mother it was um subhanallah i think just even being behind the camera brought up some sense that it's an inescapable thing that you know like you said death doesn't take any days off and i think you were telling us one time that subhanallah there's been such a great response to the video um on our channel alone i think it surpassed a million and i think we saw someone on, on the russian channel 
had translated your video. The entire video in Russian. And they Russian. dubbed the whole thing. So you've got voice actors for both of yourself and Kamal. <laughs> and I think that's just got just over 500,000 views. And you can see on TikTok, so many clips uh, that people have spliced from it. Mm. SubhanAllah. If I can walk you through, there was actually a few comments that uh, require a response from you. So we had one non-Muslim who commented by saying, as a non-Muslim, this was very genuine to see. Mm. Is there any reason or significance in the cleansing being from right side to left? Mm. Also, is the same thing done for women by women? Yeah. Um, so the right side is always the blessed side. Mm -hmm. We eat with our right. We step into a holy place with our right. We walk out of the bathroom with our right. Mm -hmm. So the right side is always the blessed side, subhanAllah. Mm -hmm. So we always start on the right side. Um, in relation with the women, it's exactly the same process as how we wash a man, but women wash the women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also had many people commenting for the Quran reciter, mm -hmm. who is uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al Harbi. Uh, Hafizullah, may Allah protect him. Yeah. Beautiful brother. From the Kimmel Mosque. A beautiful brother, mashallah. Um, as Brother Malik you know, mentioned, you're literally sitting with us just before the podcast is about to begin. Your phone doesn't stop. And I'm seeing your phone right now. It still hasn't stopped. Um, <laughs> forgive us while we, while we finish the podcast. But on saying that, you're clearly taking no days off. And this is a very intensive role to play. If you could walk our viewers through a typical day in your life, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, what does a typical day look like for the Muslim undertaker? I'll give you an example of a Sunday which mm -hmm. just passed. So subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Nearly every weekend I've been going to different states, just going early morning, coming back early morning next day. So mm -hmm. I only miss one day mm -hmm. if there's anything. Sunday I flew out of Adelaide at 6 a.m. Uh, a 4 a.m. wake, 5.30 a.m. board, 6 a.m. flight. Two and a half hours later you're in Sydney. 8.30 a.m. I'm on the way and I get the call for a funeral. As I'm going to pick up my car and go to the mosque, it becomes three funerals wow. and they require picking up. Mm. So straight to Liverpool Hospital, fight with the paperwork people, get the man out. And this is a man who I was a bit dear to me because I buried his wife 45 days before he actually died on Sunday. That's so, and subhanAllah, I just felt, you know what, I have to fight for this guy. We got our brother Mazen out of the hospital. We got the baby picked up and the lady was picked up already. Went straight back to the funeral parlor, washed the two males. Female was getting washed. And now it's time for the prayers, taking up to the mosque and then heading to the cemetery. And, you know, subhanAllah, for me, those days are normal. Mm -hmm. You know, I finished my day about 4 p.m. Then I went to Aza for Alayhamu Khole Chamma, a beautiful hajj that we grew up learning about the Kemba Mosque through him. Alayhamu Yaghfar Lahu. And subhanAllah, I didn't finish till about 8.30 at night. And I got home, my wife just looked at me and said, we didn't even see you, like, and you came straight into it. I said, you know, I feel, subhanAllah, the blessing and the strength comes from Allah. There's no need to take a pre-workout. There's no need mm -hmm. to take anything mm -hmm. when you have this fire in you because you do what you love. Mm -hmm. I believe I'm built for it. I believe it's come at the right time in my life, especially after my kidney transplant, and I've regained my health. And, you know, I, I look at it like this that these people I service and give them their last rights on this earth, the living and the non-living. The non-living, I believe, inshallah, on the day of judgment, judgment, they will be witnesses for me mm. to Allah SWT saying, Ya Allah, He gave us and fulfilled our rights to the T as quick as possible. Mm. And the living, the da'at will come from them too. Mm, yes. So I, I kind of always say, when you're at the worst day of someone's life, they're going to remember you. Mm. And, and you're just sowing seeds, bro. You're just planting, you're harvesting, mm -hmm. and you're waiting to see it all. The days my veil is lifted, and I return back to Allah. Inshallah, it's all accepted. And mm -hmm. all the people that are, you know, moving along with this journey mm -hmm. are feeling it too, and their deeds are accepted too, inshallah. Oh, you're literally living, you know, this experience. You're seeing this experience, something that we usually keep at the back of our mm -hmm. minds. It's front and center to you every single day. That is death. You just mentioned something pretty powerful. You said that there was a, a, a wife that died. Mm. And 45 days later, her husband died, you know, from natural causes. Yes. Is this something that you see often, you know, someone dying perhaps from grief or, yeah. or, or heartbreak, whereby mm. they follow each other in their death in close proximity, like mm. the Prophet Sallallahu so Alaihi Wasallam and, and Fatima. And Fatima is Allah 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 anha. Allah. Have you witnessed that? Yeah, look, not long ago I had a, I visited uh, a couple that were in their house. Mm. Their house was made up as a makeshift hospital. The husband was one room. 
The wife was another room. They had nurses attending every day. They were like hospital rooms in the house set up for their palliative care. Once the wife died, not even a week later, yeah, he followed through. Yeah, Allah. And Allah Akbar, man, it gets me all the time because when you bury them and you usually see one of them at the funeral of the other and then you're doing the other one and they're in the same position where the first was. And then when you go back and visit the cemetery and you see both names in that one grave, it gives you relief because you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has you re reunited them with the love of their lives because imagine 50, 60 years together. How are you going to live and keep going when they're out of your life? People get attached to an animal. How do you not get attached to the one who, you know, fathered your, mothered your children? You know, all this, you know, man, you know what marriage is. It's a muadde, yeah, it's, it's a muhabbe, it's, it's a big, big rahmah from Allah. There's nothing to live for after this, man. Yeah. And I see it all the time, especially with the old people that once they lose their partner, they've lost life. They've lost the zest for life. And, and, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them back, I think, because yeah. together, because the souls will reunite in Barzakh, inshallah. And it's like nothing happened again, Ya Rabb. What a heart-touching story. That was beautiful, subhanAllah. It shows true love, you know, in this life and the next life. And even that uh, firaq, that separation, mm -hmm. you know, keep it keep it short so that we, you know, we we are reunited with those whom we love. Hajj, I have to ask you though, you know, as we've just seen evidently that, you know, these stories do reach us and we do have a reaction to them. I have to ask you, um, so as we've just seen, like Ivan, I can't help it holding back the tears, but... Is there a time, do you, do you often get asked a question, you know, have you become desensitized to this? How do you deal with the grief of going through this every day? You know, subhanAllah, like, oh, I'm, I feel so emotional now because I just left the mosque and yesterday through an email of a third party, I get an email saying, brother, uh, my sister is a Muslim, but we are not Muslim and we can't afford her funeral. She's been at the coroner for 14 days. She's 38 years old. She's got five children under the age of 18. Her youngest being 14 months. Can I cremate her? Because mm. I, don't I don't know anything about Islam and she's mm. Muslim and I want to give her wishes and I don't want to feel any sort of things I've done wrong, any burden on me. I said, you have to bury her mm. and don't even talk about the money. And, you know, I um, we went and picked her up from the coroner. She's at the mosque right now. She got washed and shrouded. I was there to see the family. And Allah Akbar, man, I put up a, a, a group of, announcement last night on Janeze, please come attend for this sister because she has nobody to pray for her. Mm. And I wanted the family that come, the very small family, to see what Islam's about, mm. that we brothers and sisters in Islam support each other at the time of death. And there was ladies in that room with her and a couple of the family members sitting there. And I saw one sister, subhanAllah, she was, she was sitting on the head and she was crying to her and she doesn't even know her. She's never met this person. She told me I caught a train to get here. And she's crying for it. She's telling, she was saying all this da'a, Allah Akbar, man. I'm just picturing it now. And I thought to myself, and, and, and the family are looking weirdly like, why is she crying? How does she, where's this coming from? They don't know the sweetness, the essence of what we have with our iman, with our deen, the love that Allah puts between us. And, you know, I left them at that site and I thought to myself, Allah Akbar. And I know a lot of people are going to show up for the Janeza at 12 15. And I thought to myself, what, what little message that I acted upon through the will of Allah has resulted in? <laughs> Allahu Akbar. And then I got a phone call just half an hour ago saying there's a 15-week-year-old week fetus. Can we put it with her? And Allahu Akbar, we always know a baby is a rahmi. A mercy. And she's got a little rahmi going with her. And she had five kids. So Allah has not even forsaked her sure. from that. Sure. Well, look, every day we cry, bro. And being desensitized... It doesn't exist, man, because I believe every single person is a soul. And every soul is worth more than the whole Kaaba and everything in it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can it not be worth something to us? Mm -hmm. Every soul has a story. Every soul had a purpose. So how can we just feel like, you know, look at your fingers. They're not all the same. We're not all the same. Mm -hmm. We all have souls. And those souls all belong to Allah. Sure. And I always remember the hadith when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi stood for a funeral procession mm -hmm. and, the, and the Sahaba said to him, you know, oh, Prophet Allah, you're standing, he's a Jew. Mm, not Muslim, yeah. And he said, isn't he a soul mm. that was created by Allah? I'm not standing for him. I'm standing for Allah, the creator of the soul. Mm -hmm. Allahu Akbar, mm -hmm. look how powerful the Prophet said it to him. We 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 respect the soul. So the I, the soul. I cry and I feel like I have to run and fight 
and do what I have to to get that soul into the grave mm. because then it's with Allah. Sure. It moves on. It's out of the people of the world's hands. Sanctity of the soul, the sanctity of, you know, even a janazah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will teach us that, you know, from the rights of another Muslim to another Muslim is that he follows the janazah. Like this is a right that yeah. every Muslim owes one another. And when you see, you know, all these beautiful sisters coming to attend a sister, they had no idea who she yeah. was. It shows the beauty of our deen. It shows the beauty of, you know, this bond that we share with one another. Hajj Ahmed, I wanted to draw your attention to something which has happened in our community in the past week. I've witnessed like three big prominent families lose their father figure, lose a father. Three big prominent families within the space of a week all lose a father. Yeah. Now, I can imagine, you know, the father is the rock of the family. The father is the backbone of a family. Through your experience, how has our community dealt with, you know, the loss of a father, particularly? Look, Alhamdulillah, um, a lot of people reach out to me mm -hmm. when they know it's about to happen. The father goes into a state of Sakarat al yes. because Sakarat al can be hours, days, months. Yeah. And Alhamdulillah, I, I stay in touch with them and I guide them. And I tell them, this is what your whole Iman is going to come down to. That minute Allah takes the soul, that you say the correct words when it happens. Mm -hmm. Inna wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Hasbi Allah wa na'mal wakil. And the good words like that. I find our community, no matter how powerful, strong, they know everything, while it's all good, mm -hmm. the time of death just nullifies it all. Yeah. The time of death destroys the pleasure. You know how it's to destroy our pleasure? Yeah. It is definitely destroy our pleasure because a lot of people, they go blank. A lot of people's hard drive just goes into blank mode. Mm -hmm. They do not know what to do anymore. And alhamdulillah, I find this is when I'm able to be by their side. And I'll never not let them go from the minute they pass away to the minute I jump in the grave and put them with me and make them participate so they can always remember it. You get one father, one mother. Mm. You won't be doing it again. Mm. And I stay and I go to the Hazrat and I stay in touch with them. And then you know what I do, subhanAllah, and I'm not boasting, but I'll go visit their, their graves every now and then mm. and I send them a video. To remind them of their father so they can keep doing the art for him. Because we all forget in this world. You know, and it's just a way to keep us remembering that day that it's not over, you know. Don't feel helpless. Don't feel that my father's still getting people visiting his grave. And maybe I should go visit it. Maybe this is, you know, for me to remember. Because the world can take us in, man. We can really get caught up in this world sometimes. Actually, I want to ask you ask a leading question onto that. You know, especially as a kind of a young person now. Um, you know, for example, I'll just tell you a really small story. I was recently at Costco and Costco, we have them in Australia, but it's very Americanized. And one thing that I was so grossed out about it was not I think that's everything in bulk and everything so large, but they had fresh dev, they had, they had, they had yeah. food and grocery. And then and when you leave at the door, at the door, what do you find? It's a coffin. Yeah. So you shop and then it's kind of literally shop to you die and you walk out the door and you can buy a coffin. And recently I, my parents were telling me, and I was having some conversation with some friends as well about actually buying an allotment for your grave. And I don't know about other countries, but in one place that we found out to actually have a burial was costing someone around $30,000. And we're thinking so much now as to how much money we need just to live on everyday expenses and all the things that we want to buy. But I don't know, like I'm not really, want, the property right now in the market in Australia is very hard to buy a house, but to buy a grave, subhanAllah, and just to, I don't know. Do you have any advice? Like, do or what would you say to someone um, young, um, you know, who doesn't really ha wants to invest in so many other things and obviously live life to how we want to do and enjoy life as we can, and you know, subhanAllah, with what Allah has blessed us. But we often forget that, you know, you, you're literally going to be shopping and paying till you're dead. So how can uh, how do we have that thought of death, as Kamal was saying, at the front of our minds and knowing that we're going to end up there and all these things on the side are not really going to accumulate to anything because at the end it's just going to be inshallah yeah. you know something that's blessed with night uh, light but a ditch and under the soil like we don't know where we're standing now this could have been a grave 500 years ago yeah subhanallah so how do we keep death at the forefront of our minds all right first of all subhanallah i'll tell you one thing costco is there for business yeah and mm. funeral businesses in non-muslims is business mm -hmm. so it goes from the coffin everything outward not inward mm -hmm. different to the muslims so it's a business for them they're not there to remind people of death because that's the last thing they would do. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, subhanAllah, when people come and tell me, brother, it's so expensive to die, blah, blah, blah. I said, brother, you don't stress. When you're mm -hmm. dead, you won't be worrying about that. Let the living worry about that. <laughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forsake his slave, like the sister today. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We organise the destitute grave for her. She's being buried, alhamdulillah. So I say to people, don't worry about the things and fear mongering that, that you don't need to worry about. Yeah. Worry about how you're going to meet Allah, in what way you're going to die. And these are the more important things. How do you keep keep it real? Like the Prophet said, go visit the cemetery. Mm. Go visit these people that all had something to do the next day. Mm. All had duties to fulfill, goals to kick. They never got to do them. Mm. Go visit them. Go and ponder there because the cemetery is one place I tell everybody. There's no boasting. Subhanallah. You know, we all compete until we visit the cemetery. I've never seen someone rock up at the cemetery in a Lamborghini and Ferrari and go, look at my car. You know, I've never seen someone at the cemetery sit there talking about what I'm going to do in the world. Everybody's there for one reason, for the end. So I say to people, go visit the cemetery as the Prophet taught us because it brings you back to reality. Mm. And young or old, death doesn't have any discrimination mm. with age. So young or old, you should all go there, especially take your kids there. Mm. And another important note on that is when it comes to funerals, it's sad that the family members don't even know where the cemetery is. Mm. So we're holding up funerals because we're waiting for someone who got lost. Mm. When it's a sunnah to go visit, go visit mm. where you're going to be for a long time. There's people in that grave that have been much longer than they lived. That's right. yeah. Normalize the grave. Normalize, and that's what you've actually done, essentially. Yeah. On TikTok, you've, like, you've normalized death. You've normalized a subject that no one wants to speak about. Ustad, uh, Haji Ahmed, I wanted to speak to you about um, the topic of grief in our community. In your experience, how has our community dealt with grief? Look, grief, I find the ones who uh, live their life according to the religion mm-hmm. have built an iman. You know, look, not everyone's going to be, iman has levels. Yes. People have a high level, people have a very low level. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us cope with it. Mm-hmm. There's a mechanism there in the human body, in our futra, that the human body will live on. When that person you say, I can't live if you die, mm-hmm. you will live on. Mm-hmm. Because we learn, see, the dignity, ikram al mayyat, the dignity for the deceased in Islam is to bury as quick as possible. Yeah. Non Muslims don't understand this. Why yeah. you want him so quickly? For, yeah. Why you want to get him out? Yeah. Why, why, why? You want to get paid straight away? You know, this is the worldly thinking. But in the Islamic way, in the real thinking of dignity to the deceased, it's to get him into the next world so quickly. First of all, the body starts to go off. Dignity for mm-hmm. the deceased. Second of all, the family is in lingo. No one can go to work properly. No one can operate properly. And the third thing is that deceased needs to go back, go through the questioning, and then, you know what? Inshallah, he's got a grave of paradise. Mm-hmm. So all this falls into place by burial as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. And I always find as much as a person is, and I ask this question to him all the time, yeah. once we bury and the dirt is on, the next day I speak to the family member says, I feel at ease now. Mm-hmm. I feel like my heart has rested. My father is, I know where he is, alhamdulillah, and then they now, they start. I call them the people of the cemetery now. Mm-hmm. They start to frequent the cemetery a lot. What was a calamity has become a blessing in disguise for the living. Mm-hmm. They say, oh, brother, I haven't been, like you said, the three prominent families. Mm-hmm. I've been seeing those sons at the cemetery every day. And I said to one of them the other day, how long haven't you been to the cemetery? He goes, oh, I don't know, long, long time. And I go, you're here every day now? He goes, yeah, I love it here, man. Mm-hmm. Makes you feel at peace, yeah. subhanAllah. A calamity, we're all going to die. Death is written for every single one of us. Mm. But there's always a blessing. Mm. If, As a believer, we always say, whether it's good or bad, it's always a blessing, inshallah. Right. I say the graveyard is the quietest place with the loudest message. It's right. And it's a reminder that, Allah, you know, that constantly so true. hits us. That is so true, man. Mm. SubhanAllah, what you just said now, you know, oh, I forgot that quote. It is, it's the quietest place with the loudest message, yeah. subhanAllah. subhanAllah. Haji, I wanted to ask you, if I could, just on that. Um, subhanAllah, we often think that, you know, we are living, but most of us, you know, as we know that this is, we're actually still sleeping. And then when we, when we die, when we pass, then that's when we really wake up. But perhaps if you could explain to our viewers, perhaps what are the main misconceptions you've had um, that people have brought up about death? So what you just said now, we're sleeping, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, you know, like at kunta fi ghafli, you know, subhanAllah, you were asleep until I lifted your veil. And now your your eyes are piercing like still at the location you're going to yeah. see. Um, you know, people dealing with death and your question, sorry, was... Dealing with misconceptions about death. About death. A lot mm-hmm. of people are scared. Mm-hmm. And you know what? By all means, why wouldn't you be? Mm-hmm. The human body is always scared of and gets anxiety from something he doesn't know about, mm-hmm. hasn't experienced. And a lot of people want to scare people with death. 
Mm. So death's not scary, brother. Mm. Because the Prophet yes. told us death is a price for the believer. You've been living on this for earth for 60, 70, 80 years. You know, it doesn't get any easier to make wudu and pray fajr. <laughs> yeah. There's no days off fajr. Yeah. You can't even lift your legs to wash them anymore. Mm. That believer is not praying because, you know what, I just pray because Allah said pray. Yes, we're doing a fard, but he wants his prize, just like a student doing an exam. And what's that prize? That prize is that death. Mm. And death gets him to that next part, mm. the next life, the prize, the jannah, inshallah. Mm. So we try to help people in the sense of our misconception of death is we're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. We're not prepared for it because the first thing we ask when someone dies, how did he die, bro? Mm, yeah. You know, and if he's young, we've got this sinister thought in our head. He must have OD'd mm. or he must have this. Brother, people are dropping dead now for no reason. Yeah. I read the coroner's report, unknown. Even the coroner, through their machines and scanning, cannot even give you a conclusion. Right. Kids at 15, 16, I had two 15 year olds in the last 10 days, cancer, bone cancers. Who gets cancer at 15? Mm -hmm. Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah. You know, death has become now, I think, more acceptable, plus through COVID and what people went through, these personal mental health problems. Mm -hmm. Especially there's a lot of mental health now, Kamala. Like, people yeah. are suffering out there, man. And people want something that gives them closure, makes them feel like, you know what, this world is temporary. There's something better after this. Mm -hmm. Then it gives you hope again. Yeah. SubhanAllah. And I guess it helps deal with grief, perhaps, or with the sadness that accompanies death. Haji Ahmed, there is one, like I'm sure there are many videos of yours that have went viral that resonate deeply with, with our audience members. But for me personally, there is one video of yours from the past that has resonated with me to this very day. I'm not sure if you remember it. You were in the funeral hearse and you were driving the body of a young boy who was killed in a tragic freak accident at a Sydney school and you're with the father. Yet watching the father respond to the death of his child to his oh man i can't even speak about this oh my God. i i can't even imagine young jihad how do you cope with something like that and to see him deal with it so gracefully walk us through that moment you know i've had a few of those kind of occurrences you know brother jihad subhanallah um when this kid was killed tragically by a muslim who the water bottle fell it was an accident freak it was accident. an accident and she pressed the accelerator Went to press the brake and the water bottle got stuck under the brake and walked, crashed into the portable and two kids were killed. A young Greek kid and a Muslim kid. The day I did his funeral, I got into the hearse and his father sat next to me. And there was talk about retribution, revenge. And I asked him, because I, I, I don't hold anything back. I said, brother, are you really talking about revenge? He looked at me and said, no. He said, I attended her husband's Aze six months ago. I said, would you say that on the camera? And I went Facebook Live. And back then it was like Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And he said, yeah. And I, and I started to ask him like, and he said, he goes, I forgive her. Anam Samaha, like this. Even though that 10 year old boy was the love of his life. It was the only boy he had at the time. Mm. And Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah, that, that stuck in me. Why? Because this guy hadn't even buried his coolness of his eyes this little role model of his he was one foot behind us in that coffin like literally behind him and he's talking about forgiveness and that message come resonated around the world tv shows today all them asking us please come on I said no this message comes from our heart in islam we don't do it to show people that you know and allah akbar you know he forgave <clears throat> and alhamdulillah he actually wrote a letter for her court case to help with her case oh. and alhamdulillah at the end of the day you know she was suffering problems her husband had died she had an autistic kid had a kid that messed up and you know mm. we, we got the calamities in our mm. in our community but that was one message that went viral around the world yeah. and i see that a lot man i see i had a fa father the other day lost three daughters all from the same disease a 13 year old 11 year old and a 10 year old they get to those ages and they die when he stood there his eyes teared and he said to me ahmed i'm so happy I'm so happy they've gone back to Allah. I'm so happy that they're with the most merciful now. They're back with Sayyidina Ibrahim. Mm. They're with all these other kids that are dying. And that made me feel happy. Mm. Because if the father is talking like this, then he accepts it. He goes, Allah, he goes, Akhi Ahmed, Allah gave me these kids. Allah owns them. Allah took them back. Mm. Alhamdulillah. 
These are the words that are unbelievable when you hear at a time of a funeral. Yeah, the closure that a Muslim has. The closure. And then you get some people, they die at 95 years old and everyone's wailing and screaming. I mean, there's two sides to it, you know? Yeah. SubhanAllah. Even around with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like he had, you know, had the same tribulations of losing his children and his son, SubhanAllah, who passed away at a young age. I just want to ask you one question. I know this is, you know, on the outer shell, you're very much, you know, to break the media, you're very much the Terminator, you know, mashallah, Arnold, you're, <laughs> but you're very, very much a man with the soft core, subhanAllah. But I want to ask you a bit of a deep question here. How are you personally dealing, given your profession, as a, as a person who buries people, how are you dealing with all the loss that we're seeing right now in Gaza? With all the kids who have unmarked graves, with the parents who, subhanAllah, as we've just seen just even a couple of days ago, school was hit, a hundred people dead. Those praying Fajr, and they said not one body we picked up was intact. Not one body was had all its limbs together. Wow. How do you deal with seeing that on the screen as a person who buries people? Allah Akbar, man. Our brothers and sisters in, in, in Gaza have been chosen and favoured by Allah to go through this. They've been um, trained for it. And subhanAllah, they are all, inshallah, the inhabitants of Jannah. Yeah. And when I see all this, I hurt, I cry. And all I can say is, Ya Allah, make it easy for them because the plan of Allah is greater than the plan of ours. Yeah. And I think to myself, if we do one or two funerals and we... And people don't know what to do here. What are they doing? They're doing 30 and 40 funerals at the same time. Mm -hmm. But one thing gives me a lot of comfort. And I use this for every single child that dies mm -hmm. under the age of puberty. I tell the family, your child is with Sayyidina Ibrahim now, with all the kids that have died in Gaza. Mm -hmm. I, I use that all the time. As soon as I say that, you find their heart, eat, wallah, their eyes become happy because I've used the word Gaza, and they know what's going on. And I said, you're being given that test level. Your child now is with them. Don't worry. Go. Go and enjoy and be happy and say, alhamdulillah. And that's all we can do. They're an example for us to use here. Mm -hmm. I remember I did. I got a body once. It was in a body bag and it had been so decomposed. It was like a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. And it always reminded me of when I see these images, the guy holding the plastic bag with his family. Mm -hmm. I said, Allahu Akbar, man, I can't get that memory out of my thought when I held that bag with just bones in it and a body that was decomposed. This guy's holding his family members. He's holding people he ate and drank and slept and everything around him. What a test. Allah subhanahu Allah ma yafrijlun. Hamun ya rabbil alameen. And Allah's plan is greater than anyone's plan. And that's all we can say, man. We can't really say more than that. Keep them in our du'a. Keep them in our dua, Allah, you know, grant them victory, grant them ease and, and end to their suffering. Amen. This has been a very somber, very uh, intense conversation, very, uh, you know, a lot yeah, of Yeah, you tears. made me cry so many yeah, times. It's, it's, it's been a very difficult conversation. Uh, Hajj Ahmed, there is one last question we need to answer, and this is more of a technical question. Yeah. So obviously many of us will have to, you know, experience the loss of a loved one. And, you know, it's it's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. It's a sunnah of life. Many of us may even have to be the responsible person for facilitating or organizing the funeral uh, of a loved one from the moment they die to the moment they are buried. This is an unfamiliar territory for so many of us. If you can walk our viewers through the process, given that there are international viewers, if you can make the advice Brief. a bit more generic, but what are we supposed to do if we're responsible to uh, facilitate the funeral of a loved one? You know, subhanAllah, a quick answer to that question before mm -hmm. I get into the technical side. Lately, people have been sending me messages who are being given like orders to go home and live out your days at home. Yeah, mm -hmm. And they're telling me, brother, can I come and see the washroom? I want to see what's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. They're preparing for their death. Allah Akbar, they're not preparing for a holiday. They're preparing for their death. And I took a young guy the other day, Ali Farah, 23, who was told, go home, we can't do anything for your tumor anymore. Mm -hmm. And he said, can I come and see what's going to happen to me? Yeah. And he came and he watched a funeral. And yeah. then he prayed Janese, he's never prayed a Janese. Right. And I explained to him, this is what's going to be prayed upon you. And he went to the cemetery and he saw the grave. And he saw how we laid him down on their right side facing Qibli. I said, this is what will happen to you, to all of us. And then I took him back and he went with me to pick up another deceased. And he saw how he's going to get picked up when he does pass away. And Allah Akbar gave him a lot of uh, ease. So a lot of people uh, want to know. Yeah. And the, the process is normally, it starts off with a phone call. Okay. So know who you got to contact. Yeah. Find out who your local 
who your funeral people are in whatever part of the world you live in. There always has to be a funeral director. And it's usually connected to the mosque. You'll mm -hmm. know at the mosque who buries our deceased here. Mm -hmm. Go and visit the Muslim cemetery closest to that area because you're probably going to be buried in it or one of your loved ones will be buried. And get familiar with it. Once you establish a contact number and the time of death comes, make sure you tell the doctors or whoever's in charge that we are Muslim, we bury quickly, this cannot be stretched, we need the death certificate, the medical cause of death, done ASAP. Mm -hmm. And usually someone who's on a dying stages, they know his cause, so they prepare it, but they don't issue it till he passes away. Mm -hmm. And then you make that phone call to the funeral people, they come in a van, they pick you up, they book your funeral, they book your grave, and all that depends on what part of the world you're in. Then a time is given for you to attend for the wash. Always contribute and be part of the wash of your loved one. Aule bim, the family is aule. The family has the first preference to wash their deceased. And do not feel scared. Wallah, you will feel so enlightened after it. Give your dad that right. Give your brother that right. And it gives you that right. Once you wash, you help with the shroud, you may get a bit of time to sit and make some da'a there and viewing time and, 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 and ponder on that moment. And anyone who talks about worldly matters in that moment, move them away from yeah. there. They don't need to be there, okay? And then he's taken for his prayers, whether it's at the cemetery or in the mosque. And, and we know the prayer, the Janeza prayer is usually just four takbirat and you know, it's the easiest prayer with the highest rewards. Mm -hmm. He's carried back into the car, taken to the cemetery. And I tell family all the time, males, jump in that grave. Jump in that grave and put them to rest because that will be the last time you touch them. And you'll be the last hands that laid hands on that shroud before he moves into the barzakh. And you know, I always think of this, when I'm shrouding that deceased and people see me make the shroud so neat and tight and I say to them, I do it like this, perfect, without a crease because the Prophet Sallallahu said, shroud your deceased with the best of shroud because they visit each other in the barzakh. Mm. And I keep, I keep thinking, we're going to visit each other in barzakh because they're going to ask you about the people of the world. Like a community. Like then. a community and you want to be in the best yeah. in the best way so that people could say, Allah Akbar, you've come so beautiful. Allahumma barik, the guys that washed me, they've done the best job. They gave me the best rights. Allahu Akbar, Allah. This is how I live my life now. That's beautiful. And I hope that does familiarize our, our viewers with the process, which can be very daunting for many of our viewers at home. I think that we all face. I think that you talked about quotes. I think I remember one that comes to mind was, you know, every son should be able to wash his father when it comes to the burial. And every father should be able to be able to pray the janazah for his son. It's fine talking about funerals and stories. I'm just last week, a, a close family friend of mine, their grandfather passed away. And I saw my dear friend Yusuf um, get in the grave and lower his grandfather in the grave. SubhanAllah. So I assume a very tender elderly person so they had to lift him with some machines and but they he, he went there barefooted and he held his held his grandfather in and uh, pulled him down subhanallah just only a week before this recording subhanallah yeah, powerful. Any, oh, that's happening every day a last message brother ahmed for our viewers at home well look there's a lot of messages i can tell people and i do them every day on my social mm -hmm. media but one message i always say is my brother and sisters don't get attached to this world don't let this world be the means of your breaking of your heart. Mm -hmm. Because wallah, as the Prophet told us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, this world is not worth the wing of an insect. Mm. So do not get attached to it. Everything in this world is temporary. Everything. And once we depart this world, it will all get inherited to someone else and you will be from the people of the hereafter. So worry about the hereafter. Don't worry about you know, building this dunya, build your akhirah, mm. build the one that you're going to, because you'll be exiting this place very soon. Jazakallah oh, khairan, brother Ahmed. Oh, yeah. Follow the Muslim Undertaker for daily reminders, I believe. <laughs> Aussie Mammoth reminders. on Instagram. If you haven't watched the documentary yeah. we've pr produced with brother Ahmed, watch it now. Do yourself a favor. It will wake you up. It woke me up. Mm. Jazakallah khairan, brother oh, yeah, Ahmed. God. Just a no quick yeah. note. Everyone asks me, why is it Aussie Mammoth? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Like you're Muslim under, but why is it Aussie yeah. Mammoth? <laughs> well, Aussie Mammoth happened in my days before I got heavily involved mm -hmm. in Gym what lifting. I do yeah. in the bodybuilding days when I was in Dubai and I was uh, coordinating the first show for them with the sheikh and I was with him at night and he was he's a sheikh, like he's an actual prince and he looked at me and he said, I'm going to call you the Aussie Mammut. <laughs> that was his exact words, Sheikh Khaled. And I looked and I go, I like that name. And then he made me a belt said Aussie Mammoth on it. Oh, and I didn't have Instagram, so I made an Instagram account I called myself Aussie Mammoth. 
So I went to change it now. I thought to myself, no, nah, man, just leave it. Like it's it's become iconic. Nice. It's very yeah. so that's it's very that's fitting. where Aussie Mammoth comes from. Everyone asking, mm-hmm. what's Aussie Mammoth? Got to do with? <laughs> Thank you to the Arab Sheikh, Jazakallah Khairan. <laughs> yeah, right, and, uh, to, the, to the viewers at home, let us know in the comments, uh, inshallah, something that you took away from this episode and perhaps one of your favorite moments from this podcast. And you can also find this podcast on all your favorite streaming platforms: Spotify, Google Pop- Google Podcast, and Apple Podcast. Ahmed has been a Absolute pleasure. It's always a pleasure seeing you and your face always bring a lot of warmth to my heart and you bring such a message. And I dare I say, you know, it's a fruit and it's a it's a sweet smell and taste of honey. That's something that we will all have. Inshallah, we all meet Allah uh, beautifully as well. Keep Amen. us in your du'as to everybody at home too. Amen. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.